In Austria, we've got Craig Mayer coming to us from Bozeman, Montana. In England, we've got Andre Gribikov coming to us from California. In France, Randy Lawrence Hurt from Boston. Randy is a frequent contributor on our broadcasts, and he also runs the Boston Massacre Tournament. In Germany, we have Chicago's own Wes Ketchum, nuclear physicist uh, who uh, lives, uh, lives inside Chicago, works just outside of it at Fermilab. In Italy, we have Tommy Anderson from Boston, Massachusetts. Tommy is uh, the winner of the Liberty Cup and has the highest DBNI ranking on this board. In Russia, we have Advait Aronov coming to us from Singapore. It's good to see Advait again. I haven't seen his name up here for, uh, for uh, a little bit. And in Turkey, we have Mehmet Alpazlan coming to us from New York. Uh, Mehmet was the uh, player's choice winner from, I believe, Liberty Cup. Um, so Liberty Cup or Boston Massacre. Anyway, uh, Mehmet uh, was an interviewee on one of the wrap-up shows. Uh, really nice guy, really good attitude about playing. And uh, also a bit of an alliance player. At least he, he's, he's fairly new to the game, I think. And that was his, uh, that's sort of his initial default approach. All right, let me show you guys the board positions and then I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on the board. And uh, Marcus, we'll start with you on this one. What, uh, does anything jump out to you about this particular board? Um. It's not got the moves on it. <laughs> oh, I just mean that just the, oh, uh, the players, right? Yeah, the players, um, yeah. yeah, I mean Tommy Anderson. I know um, he's. I, I've jammed games for him. He is probably the most charismatic diplomacy player I've ever come across. <laughs> so I would not be surprised to see him do well. You know, you. It's almost a pleasure lo losing supply centers to him because he's. <laughs> uh, and I, yeah, I've heard the similar things about Mehmet. So this is. Um, Good board from that perspective. Randy in France. Hopefully we see the uh, DBM representation doing quite well. <laughs> All right, Siobhan, what about you? You you recognize several people on this board, I'm sure. I do, yeah. Craig, Randy, Wes, and Tommy I've known for years from tournament play. Um, all very strong players. I would expect to see Randy and Craig both try and make a big score here. Um, it's been a while since we've seen their names in the tournaments, and I think they want to remind people that they are very good players. Um, Andre is a new name to me, but apparently he's in California. Um, so I love to see more players on the West Coast. That's always awesome. And Advit and Mehmet, both great players. Um, I've gotten to know their play quite well this year. All right, and uh, Wes, I know pretty well. He is a, he's a new player this year, just started in, uh, I think, February or January, uh, but has uh, made a big splash and is certainly currently sitting on top of the Windy City Weasels league standings. So uh, Wes is a very... Is a very uh, shifty player, very smooth, and um, very much capable of convincing you into doing something that uh, maybe isn't in your best interest, but is rather in his. All right, so this time, um, let us, uh, you know, let's just stick with odd and even. So odd numbers uh, were, odd number years were, uh, were Marcus being the, uh, the primary analyst. So Marcus, we'll start with you here. Uh, tell us what jumps out to you about fall 01, uh, spring 01 moves. Okay, well, painful for Austria. That's my first thoughts. Um, obviously, the Italian getting into Trieste sometimes represents Aquila Panto, uh, especially combined with the move to Apulia instead of the move to Venice. Uh, I have a feeling it's going to result in a painful result for Austria because Russia also gets into Galicia. That indicates they tried to make a demilitarized zone that didn't work out. So, yep, that. <laughs> what can I say that's very, very painful? Um, this is also part of the reason why if you demilitarize Galicia, have a have an objective for that. <laughs> so then maybe if you're covering from the Italian or something, it's okay. But moving to Budapest, I just don't like all that much. It's nice, to, you know, it's nice to see the contrast here between the, the two games. Both games have Austria, you know, apparently making a deal with, with Russia and in one sense getting away with it and doing really well. And in this sense, not getting away with it and probably it's probably not going to work out too well. Yeah, I guess uh, Budapest is a high variance move in that respect because it does give you control, like a certain amount of control over the Balkans. But if something like this happens, just ouch. Um, yeah, elsewhere, pretty standard moves. Uh, I like, really, I can't see anything not standard on this board. Uh, right. Sean, yeah. what, uh, what do you wish uh, he had focused on more? Um, I completely agree with your analysis here. <clears throat> I think Craig in Austria went high risk and there was potential for a high reward, but I don't think it'll pay off. It does indeed sound like he and Tommy probably tried to arrange a key. Whether or not Tommy sticks with it is yet to be seen. 
Yeah, I have to say, it almost feels like, you know, it, this doesn't make any sense chronologically, but it, it kind of feels like uh, Craig, you know, saw the broadcast of the first game uh, so far. And then, you know, it was like, I, I, I'm going to do that. Obviously, that didn't happen. Fewers at home. These games were played simultaneously. All right, let's move uh, on He's to time traveling. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, Craig's got skills. Marcus, tell us what happens in Fall 1901. Okay, that's actually worked out for Austria uh, as well as it could. Um, Italy tries to do it. It's not the exact Kilo Panto, obviously. Normal Kilo Panto, he goes to Serbia, but uh, is able to cover Budapest for the Austrian um, and aids them in that respect. Austria only loses one. And in return, Italy moves into the Aegean Sea, accelerating that, that uh, Austria-Italy alliance. Russia, Turkey have clearly been able to work something out in response. Turkey moves into Constantinople, but the fact they've had to move in Smyrna with the army is going to hurt them. They can't build there. Um, in the West, we see England getting supported into Belgium. Uh, Germany's giving that support. France goes for Belgium as well, so maybe France thought they had German support. And we hope, well, we're probably going to see an England-Germany alliance here, especially considering the balance out of Sweden. Siobhan, what, uh, what deserves more attention? Um, no, I think that's spot on. Again, um, there's not much else to talk about. There is, a yeah, the balance in Sweden. But, I mean, this is a fairly balanced board after 01. Nobody's jumping out to me. Huge. I'm not surprised that the Germans supported the English player into Belgium instead of the French. Um, but I don't think Randy can be too surprised by that. I mean, we got to give a shout out to Wes here for getting away with not covering Munich. Um, this is it's first, first of all, it's a, it, this is a, it's a higher skilled move. You know, you often see players, uh, less experienced players cover Munich in this case and more experienced players not. Um, but even then that can come back to bite you. And Randy is a very experienced player and easily capable of doing double reverse psychology on Wes and, uh, and taking Munich anyway. But, uh, you know, that might, that might not be strategically wise in the long term, even if it's tactically delicious. All right, let's, uh, let's see some uh some builds here and we've got england going full anti-france here Ooh. that is two fleets positioned directly at randy lawrence hurt's throat wes for his part does not put down a fleet um and uh you could make a real strong argument that he didn't need another army uh in the assault on france here um but uh perhaps this is a signal to russia that uh that you're not going to mess with them um elsewhere we've got uh really nothing surprising uh you know as 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 marcus mentioned turkey had a logistical problem uh, based on those moves i think you'd rather have seen him go to black sea there and then uh and pull the army back to ankara uh but now you know guaranteed at black sea if uh if they want it so all right let's uh let's keep going here we'll pause after 1902 for uh for a strategy sesh and Siobhan, you are up for a uh, main analyst in 1902. Tell us what you see in spring. All right. Well, I don't know what Randy said to Andre in England, but he has clearly committed all of his fleets against Randy. Um, Randy, for his part, is doing what he can. Um, but the German, that EG, is solid, and I believe will continue to be so. Though some confusion, now that bounce in north must be planned. The English doesn't want to leave Norway yet, and I'm not sure Denmark wants to leave either. Um, otherwise, some repositioning by the Italian and the Austrian, which has some odd trades happening here. Uh, Romania gets into Serbia, but Serbia gets into Bulgaria, and the Turk supports themselves into Black Sea. <laughs> so... Well, that's, oh, that's a, a lot of arrows tactic. there. I've missed something, it's, but it's a funny, it's a funny tactical situation. We can spend a second on after this. Uh, Marcus, what, uh, what would you like to focus on? Yeah, I mean, situation in the south is the big one, but it's so complicated. I think I'm going to talk about the north first. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, got, like, you get one, you get one thing, man. One thing. Oh, okay. Actually, I'm gonna like ignore the south then and say Bothnia to Baltic, because clearly. The England Germany came to some kind of agreement with the Russian. There was no build up there in St. Petersburg, no attempt to hold that against them. They said, okay, you know, it was probably let me into Sweden and, you know, I won't do anything. I'll just sit there and, and let you do your thing. Um, and England Germany agreed to this, and then Russia goes to the Baltic and Kiel and Berlin are both uh, open right now. <laughs> um, We'll see whether Russia chooses to push that. Obviously, doesn't have any additional units on that front, but uh, it's an interesting situation. 
Yeah, I mean, look, St. Petersburg is wide open now. Uh, Pain-free move for England if they want it. Uh, whether it's strategically wise is, a, is another question. But G- Germany Germany can cover all these centers, no problem. It's just a question of, um, wh- you know, uh, whether it's worth the potential sacrifice of, of having centers open. But this is, now you see clearly what one, one way in which not having another fleet in the north is a problem, uh, just in the immediate sense, let alone the long-term sense of the alliance with the EG. Uh, okay, let's talk about tactics down here. Uh, this is hilarious. Uh, and, you know, I think you see one problem here of leaving this army in Apulia that they really could have made an argument for bringing it up to Venice and then you could mm-hmm. cover Trieste here without having to sacrifice Albania. But now you have to, you, you have no choice. You have to cover Trieste because displacing Asa, Russia here would leave the, uh, would leave it open for the, the retreat. So. Uh, and that's if you could displace it, you know, there's, it's not clear that you actually can. Um, okay. Let's, uh, let's keep going here. Uh, fall of 1902. Siobhan, tell us what you see. Okay. Um, as expected, covering Trieste and then a whole bunch of red arrows down there in the South. So I'm trying to figure out what they decided to do. They did try to pop Serbia. Didn't work. Uh, Turkey tried to convoy into Bulgaria, but Russian support was, both supports were cut. Okay, so aside from the Italian moving into the Eastern Med and the Russian in Ukraine, not a ton changes down there. Um, yeah, there, there are four cut supports here, uh, all in the same area. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, in the West, um, the English continue to try their assaults on Randy in France, but don't get very far this turn. Um, and... Russia loses St. Pete and Sweden remains unowned for another year. All right, Marcus, what's the one thing you want to focus on? Yeah, Baltic Sea still uh, doesn't go for Kiel, doesn't go for Berlin. <laughs> Germany will cover both of those, doesn't even go to Denmark, which would have gotten us. <laughs> yeah. So the move to Baltic seems completely pointless. Uh, they should have just gone to Sweden in that spring phase and hoped that the EG wouldn't kick them out again. Well, we talked about we talked about, you know, Germany being able to cover all of these. So uh, the only way they could guarantee to cover all of them would be to leave Sweden open. So it seems to me that Advait went for that option, thought that Germany was going to take the most conservative possible uh, option here. And Wes has now left all three of his uh, home supply centers exposed to enemy attack uh, during this game just in the first two years and has gotten away with every single one of them. So. Well, I think Wes gets the award for um, uh, for uh, for Iron Stomach so far, <laughs> if there is such. Okay, uh, let us uh, let's keep going here. And in the build section, we just get another fleet from <laughs> <laughs> from Andre. Andre is saying, "Nah, <laughs> mine." Yeah, nah. Yeah, it was interesting. You're right. Is that uh, Mid Atlantic is now guaranteed, assuming that the German taps breast. And the problem with that is that the Mid-Atlantic could retreat to North Atlantic. The problem for that, from a defensive perspective, if you're England, if you are obsessed with defense in England, you might think, oh, I need a fleet here in order to cover North Atlantic. Um, Is that too conservative from a longer term tactical standpoint? Siobhan. I think it is. Um, We often see England's not building the armies that they desperately need early on. But what this actually really smacks of to me in this moment is an EG alliance where they've said, I'm England, I will only build fleets. I'm Germany, I will only build armies. This makes us mm. feel safe. I've I've played against these kind of alliances. They're really frustrating. Um, but Germany put down only armies last turn and it just feels like Wes has sold Andre on the, you're England, you need fleets. That's all you need. It's fine. And... Marcus, if that's the case, if this is a uh, German fle- German armies and English fleets alliance, uh, who does that benefit more? Germany, 100%. Like England has a position to stab Germany, but they can't solo if they only build fleets. There's no way you can do that. And if you build all your armies in the late game, everyone's going to realize you're about to solo before you get there. Obviously, face-to-face game, you don't necessarily expect to go for a solo. So maybe they just want a solid board top. And in that case, England's a bit better off because they can't be stabbed. But it, it, they're very limited in what centers they can take. They can only go for coastal centers. Um, and, and it's worth pointing out that in Carnage scoring, a solo is extremely valuable. 
Um, if you, mm -hmm. the best you can do as a board topper, in fact, all board toppers score about a quarter of the available points and, um, a soloist will get hundred percent of the, uh, available points. So that, uh, solo is worth almost exactly four times as much under carnage scoring as uh, a regular board top. And there are only two games in this tournament. So a solo here would almost guarantee the win. Obviously you would, you would need, uh, uh, that would assume that nobody else solos as well. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's... Important to note also that uh, it, in the case where Germany's building only armies and England's building only fleets, I think it's a lot easier for Germany to stab than it is for England. If England stabs and then builds armies, they then have to get those armies over and try and push further. Uh, Germany can just put fleets down on the board, go for Scandinavia. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a nice point because not only um, like not only do you have to convoy the armies over if you're England, but you often have to repopulate the sea spaces in between in order to do the convoy. So it's it's two, you know, and then you also have to get the fleets out of the way that are forward. So it is logistically very, very difficult. Um, but uh, but, you know, in, in Germany's case, you have a similar problem. You have to build the fleets and get them into position. Um, so, OK, let's keep going here. And uh, spring of 1903 means that Marcus is up first. Marcus, tell us uh, ooh, lots of black arrows on this board, more than I would have thought. OK, yeah. Uh, well, I'll look at the north first because that's less complicated. Uh, once again, the Russian fleet gets outguessed. Um, Germany leaving Berlin open. <laughs> there's still well, there's no attempt to move to Sweden. And Russia just gets the 50-50 wrong, goes for one of the two that's being covered. Um, England and Germany continuing their push is very slow. It always is against France, uh, but they're just going to keep hammering away and hope that the East stays in chaos. And speaking of the East being in chaos, <laughs> man, oh man, is it in chaos. Um, Italy and Austria sticking together, trying to kick the Russian out of these centers, but the Russian has the Turk back on side, uh, manages to get into Bulgaria, <laughs> loses Serbia, retreats to Albania, so still has that position. <laughs> Um, they don't have a unit in Romania anymore, and they didn't manage to get into Galicia, so I think the Austria-Italy has kind of won out in this situation, but it's still very stale, Macy. They're still... Neither of them is getting anywhere first. Siobhan, what do you want to follow up on? Um, I think you've just about covered everything, including that chaos in the South, but I just want to give a quick round of applause for Wes for guessing right twice in a row around Denmark, Sweden, Baltic chaos. That is A+. plus. Wes, Wes has the mojo, the guessing mojo going right now, the rock, paper, mm -hmm. scissors champion so far. Uh, I, you know, I kind of want to give a shout out to Turkey here. Um, Mehmet is, uh, he, you know, he has fleets in the Aegean and Eastern Med, and so far he's holding firm. Um, so, uh, he, he might, uh, you know, and now the threat from Bulgaria is, is gone for at least the turn. So, uh, yeah, Mehmet's looking at least like he can survive, you know, whether he can thrive or not is another question. All right, let's keep on going here. We've got fall of 1903 orders and Marcus, uh, tell us what you see. Okay. Lots more red arrows and Russia finally guesses correctly. <laughs> the problem with continuously leaving centers open, no matter how good a guesser you are, you're eventually going to lose out. Germany does make up for the uh, the center. In fact, I think he takes two centers because he gets Sweden and um, Brest and only loses one. So he does still get the build in Kiel. Um, we see England getting nothing, getting knocked out of Burgundy, still extremely slow progress on the uh, French front, as expected. Um, France guesses, like, not covering Portugal ended up being, I mean, it, it didn't really matter where he went with that unit there, but doesn't lose anything in Iberia. Um, over the other side of the board, <laughs> lots of red arrows. As said, we see Black Sea trying to get into Sevastopol which is a very interesting situation. <laughs> Just maybe trying to get that build so they can stick it in Smyrna and get a little bit more security. But is it worth risking their only alliance for? <laughs> yeah, you have to wonder about that. Um, all right, Siobhan, uh, what do you wonder about? Um, I do wonder if Turkey tried to sell it to Russia saying, oh, you're probably going to get a unit off of Germany. You'll stay even. I need to build in Smyrna. Um, Maybe he thought he'd get it. Maybe it was agreed upon. Maybe the Russian was like, yeah, no. It's... No. Um, so I wonder about that negotiation. Um, as expected, the English player is going to just bash his head against Randy in France for a while and could have walked into Portugal, though. 
Yeah, it could work out in the long run though for um for England, couldn't it? It could. We'll see. We'll see. Interesting set of uh interesting choice here by the you know the sort of uh the the Vulcan mind reader uh Wes Ketchum of this game so far. You know, he he could have guaranteed that Kiel and Berlin were covered here uh, and um would have been able to cover all three of them. This set of moves guaranteed that he had a, a keel or Ber uh, that had one of these open for a fleet build. Mm -hmm. And so he might have recognized that he was guaranteed to pick up Brest and Sweden. So at worst would lose, um, uh, would have, would at worst would have one build and wanted to guarantee that he could build a fleet. If he had covered both keel and Berlin, he, you know, might not have been able to do that. So it'd be interesting to hear from him if that was his intention here, or if he was just, you know, guessing again and finally didn't get it right. Well, and to just sort of piggyback on that for a second, the self bounce in Kiel tells me that he absolutely wants the fleet in Kiel. Mm. If he had tried to cover both, he wouldn't have had the choice. And in this case, if he had tried to bounce both of them, he would have wound up having to put the fleet in Berlin. Mm. So what that tells me about his future direction of a fleet in Kiel rather than Berlin is interesting. All right, let's find out. Uh, we do have, in fact, a fleet build in Kiel. Russia got uh, what I believe was a rebuild, correct? Um, yeah. Or did they? Is it that? Because they lost Serbia. Um, Picked up Bulgaria. Oh no! So they did get a build here because they had a one-on-one -on -one exchange with Austria and picked up Berlin. So right. Okay. Okay. So that is a natural build. Uh, puts down an army in Warsaw. Elsewhere, uh, that's it. Those are the only two builds here. All right. Let's keep on going here. And spring of 1904, Siobhan, you are up first. Tell us what. Yep. Uh, tell us what you see. Oh, Kiel goes to the Baltic, not to Helgoland. That's disappointing. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, it, you know, a fleet in Kiel is so versatile because it can go either direction and you don't necessarily have to tip your hat. Um, meanwhile, the English player still gets gets Burgundy. Um, Randy spends some time trying to reposition his units so that they're more useful to him. Um, retreats to Picardy, which is fun. Um and then meanwhile in the south, um, has the Italian decided that bashing his head against the Turk is just not worth it? It does look like it. Um, repositions to the Ionian. And then just, to... oh, and Russia takes Greece. Okay, so we've got a swap <laughs> of Greece and Bulgaria. Yeah, this is this is the definition of dipsy doodle, what's been going uh... on down here. All right, Marcus, what, uh, what do you want to focus on? What do you wish? No, I mean, I'm actually just thinking is this a good idea for the English player to be doing right now? Like, it's it's definitely, like, sticking with an EG can absolutely work, but is this the way you want to be playing the EG? You've already given them breast, and now you're just doing things like tapping Gascony instead of trying to advance your position um, or go for something like Portugal, go for something like Spain or Western Mediterranean. Sure, you could lose the guess, but it's more likely to get you something immediately. Um, I see. Interesting. So your suggestion here is that this may be a moment for strategic realignment. Um, if you're if you're England, maybe it's what you want. Maybe France has been able to stall long enough here to change the strategic calculus or to allow it to change. Potentially, like there's always the the thing of once you have France on the ropes like this, you do kind of want to kill them because you've invested so much in it. <laughs> Otherwise, France is going to get that strong defensive position back. But I think at least England should be trying to be more aggressive uh, and get centers for themselves. Um, if they're going to attacking France, and they're you know they've got the weakness now in Belgium, right? And you've got lots of um, enemy units. There's certainly an opportunity here for Germany if uh, if Germany wants to be tricky. And my experience of West Ketchum is that he has the uh, capacity to be tricky. He's a, a very skillful and nimble player. Um, that's the way to put it. All right, let's talk about some builds and what we. I'm sorry, fall of 1904. We have a whole oh. set of unit of moves to go through. Siobhan, tell us what you see. Um, something I noticed at the very end of that last season when we were talking is that Tunis has been unowned up until this point. <laughs> um, and so Randy picks that up, um, you know, and but loses Portugal for the effort. Thank you. I appreciate, Andre, that you were moving some of those fleets. You took some risks, but I think they were all worth it. Uh, you wind up with a unit. You protect Belgium. Germany goes down one. So if there was thought of stab, Germany now has to rethink. Well, takes Berlin back. So even. Um, and, and with a rebuild now, yeah. And with a rebuild. I think this is a great moment for the EG. I think that they can decide how to reassess and move forward in a more efficient way. And Craig takes Greece. 
while the Austrian takes Romania and the Russian loses Bulgaria to the Turks. So this is a bad turn for the Russian. Yeah, uh, Tommy takes Greece here. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. in Italy. Uh, all right, Marcus, what do you? Uh, what should have gotten more attention here? All right. I mean, the Rus the German disband in Brest had the option to retreat to Gascony. You got to wonder why they didn't do that if they're trying to crack the French player as fast as possible. Uh, where are they going to rebuild? It's got to be in Munich. Munich's not not as helpful as being in Gascony here if you're trying to push that advantage. Um, so. I think Germany's going to stick with England still, but I feel like the retreat to Gascony would have just been better. But combined with the move to Bothnia, that is uh, that is a <laughs> um, interesting move. Let's it's say. a choice. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, so Russia is probably the big loser here. Um, although it does Austria Austria is going to get a rebuild here, not a build. While Italy Italy gets a full build and France gets a build here as well. I mean, look, let's uh, let's give some mm -hmm. props to Randy Lawrence Hurt here for, you know, it's it, this is one of those moments where you pull a you pull a piece further away from where you need it in order to generate a piece back in your home centers. So this mm -hmm. is one case where that may actually have been a good idea. Um, I often don't like that sort of thing, but here he it's going to take him one turn to get that unit back into Western Mediterranean. It didn't actually mm -hmm. cost him anything. There was nothing else he could have done with it here and now he's going to get a unit in Marseille, presumably an army. Yeah, and I just want to take a moment and talk about that bounce in Marseille, mm -hmm. leaving it open for a build. There was definitely a 50-50 there of, is England going to go to Marseille? Am I going to wind up in the center where I want to put my build? And so that moment where you guess right on that is always really satisfying. <laughs> Yeah, I think from England, from Andre's perspective, he figured that Spain wasn't go uh, was going to have to choose between Portugal and Marseille. Um, mm -hmm. And so just kind of wanted to guarantee. Obviously, I think if you're Andre, you'd rather this fleet still be in the English Channel. But given, you know, that Germany didn't uh, <laughs> didn't retreat to Gascony and is now in Bothnia, yeah, maybe you're uh, you're not so unhappy having this unit pull a little further back. All right, let's uh, let's see some builds here. We've got. A bunch of armies all across the board. Everyone builds an army uh, who can build, except for Italy, who puts down Fleet Naples. Uh, of these, I think the English is probably the most interesting. Um, the uh, it's uh, probably he's probably going to try to get it on into Spain. That's kind of the only place it could go directly. But uh, but who knows? I mean, he kind of had to build an army, right? It's just what is he going to do with it now? How can he employ it? I think the I, move into Spain is actually guaranteed because you yep. can cut say uh, it's a oh yeah convoy coming up. <laughs> yeah, 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 well done, well done, well done. Uh, you could make an argument here though that uh, you you could really use a, a unit on North, but this uh, this case your units are all poised to hit France, and so any thought of a turn against Germany from England's perspective would be at least a year premature. Yeah. And let's uh, spring of nineteen oh five. Let's stick with our our rubric that we were on. And um, uh, Marcus, let's stay with you calling out the, the tactics and tell us about spring of 1905. Okay, so there's that guaranteed convoy into Spain I think we ended the last session by talking about. Um, Randy obviously realizing this just abandons it. And actually Randy just pushes everything against the, not really against the German front, against Belgium more than anything. Um, I wonder if that's a tactic to try and say, okay, I can just move past you, England. I'm going to let you have uh, Spain. Just like try and rotate round and don't attack me, and and maybe I can weaken Germany for you. Uh, might be something I'd be willing to take in this scenario as England, just because England, France only has armies apart from that um, North Africa fleet. So uh, we also see um, Italy moving into Tyrrhenian Sea, into Tunis successfully. So that's potentially a move to the, a successful move to the West. Uh, Germany moving full out against the East, moving into Finland, Livonia, uh, Cilicia, and Munich. And in the South, we still have this mess of uh, attacks. <laughs> the Russian fleet moves into Armenia, um, which is an interesting decision and supports the Turkish units into a, into Sevastopol. Um, I guess I'll leave that for strategic discussion. <laughs> uh, Austria moves into Trieste and into Tyrolia potentially to attack the Italian. 
<laughs> all right, all right, all right, Siobhan, tell us, uh, tell us what you uh, help us understand what the hell is going on here. I um not sure I do understand it myself. Um, I've been staring at that Austrian, Russian, Turkish convoy around the Black Sea and have been attempting to come up with an explanation where it makes sense to me. Um, and it. Uh uh, so Craig, let's talk about Craig here for a second, right? So, uh, you know, supports that convoy into Sevastopol and then also sends uh, units. He looks like he's going to pick up two, uh, mm -hmm. two Italian dots here. Um, at Craig, we, we tend to think of Craig as a bit of an alliance player, correct? He generally is, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so for him to so quickly shift, I mean, it. there has to be some conversation between the Austrian and the Turk saying, you know what, we've been trying this, this isn't working we've got to change it up. And I, Craig is willing to change, change the alliance structure because, you know, at this point it's 1905 as Austria, he's been at four the entire game. I'm going to be a little tired of that too. So if he can pick up two here, that's fantastic. Yeah. And plus uh, potentially also helping Russia and Turkey reconfigure their, their tactical situation. It wouldn't surprise me if this agreement, um, well, now see, it, Turkey can't displace, uh, <laughs> right? Like... <laughs> if the agreement was from Advait was, yeah, now dislodge me in Armenia and I will disband. <laughs> then well, well done. Well done. Oh Advait. my God. Yeah. I think this is just Advait sort of pulling one over Craig saying, Oh, I'll get you into Sevastopol. You'll get a dot Turkey. That'll be fine. And then meanwhile, now Turkey has to use Khan to cover Ankara if Turkey also wants to hold Sevastopol, but that leaves Bulgaria open to the Austrian if he wants to get really greedy. And then there's the Italian on the other side with I... you know, Greece and the Aegean. And uh, and then, I mean, let's also, uh, we, we got to move on here. We're taking, we're luxuriating yeah. in this turn a little bit much, but uh, Livonia retreats to Prussia. <laughs> oh, 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 I think this actually may be an arranged swap of centers where Russia is going to take Ankara and the Turkish army is going to advance forward. I think that's the most likely reason for this uh, move set, mm -hmm. but I guess. Um, I mean, if, if that's the case, then, you know, also well done by Turkey, just bounce them in, our, in Ankara. Uh, all right, let's find out how this uh, alphabet soup uh, ends up getting devoured and uh, tell us about it, uh, Siobhan. <laughs> Is is the Russian just done with the I'm game? sorry. Uh, it, it looks like yeah. it. Uh, Marcus, you're the one calling yeah, out the right, yeah. for us. Yeah, Marcus, yeah, tell us about it. Russia just actually lets all his senses go here, um, which I guess is another reason why you might make those moves. Uh, <laughs> supporting the Turk into Sevastopol, supporting the Turk into Moscow, and attempting to bounce Warsaw, but it doesn't seem, it doesn't really do anything at all. Um, Elsewhere, we have clearly the English player uh, agreed with the German that, okay, you can take one center since I'm taking two. Uh, although their two were not guaranteed, they weren't necessarily going to get Brest, so they could have just given Germany a build for no reason. I think we've seen that quite a lot from the English player this game, though, prioritizing their allies, uh, their alliance over their own expansion. Um, elsewhere, France tries to make that move against the German, I think. It could potentially be against Belgium. Um, and say, okay, England, please just work with me. I'm going to put you into Western Med. We can put you into Tunis. Uh, but England's having none of it. And the uh, Austrian... Belgium, Belgium was there for the taking with an open retreat to Holland. But uh, yeah. that seems like a missed, missed opportunity. All right, uh, um, Siobhan, talk to us about the strategic situation here. I mean, the strategic situation here is I, I think that the players in the West have made up their minds about the directions they're going um, to Randy's frustration. He can't get the English player to change direction. Um, I feel for Advait in Russia because this just looks like a moment of sheer frustration with the game and just saying, you know what? I'm throwing my dots to someone. Uh, Turkey, have them. Please go attack someone who was mean to me in the end. Um, you know, Craig is, to to his benefit with this stab, has picked up his two dots. Um, you know, and that's it's a great position to be in. But, you know, it's mid-game and the East is still sorting out what it wants to do. And I think the West has the drop on them. 
Yeah, it's interesting with Germany, um, you know, looking so strong at the moment uh, and, you know, England not really having a, anyone threatening uh, even Germany. Uh, well, uh, yeah, right. Sorry. So that we agreed that that was uh, an arranged uh, taking of uh, St. Petersburg here. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you can make the argument that Austria needed just needs more units, um, but they also don't really need an enemy on the other side. So uh, I well, it's Austria needs more dots, but at the expense of irritating the Italian and a Turk who just picked up two Russian home centers who will be sitting behind him with new units. Yeah, I feel for uh, I feel for Advait here. I you know in the Carnage system, you could make an argument that uh, it, he probably figured he was going to be in last place no matter what. Uh, no one else was going to get eliminated before him, so uh, so why not let his dots be useful for someone else and you know pick up some goodwill or something like that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep going here. In uh, winter of 1905, the builds we see uh, Randy Lawrence Hurt uh, seeing the writing on the wall, picking up all three of his northern uh, northern armies, leaving. Uh, <laughs> leaving an army in Piedmont and a fleet in North Africa. Uh, you know, actually, I love the holding of the fleet in North Africa. I think that's it's one last hope that maybe he can give England a reason to uh, to let him live. Elsewhere, uh, the Russian the Russian units go away, and Austria puts down two armies. Um, the uh, and the Turk puts down one army. So we didn't uh, actually we didn't focus a whole lot on uh, Turkey losing Smyrna, but that looks to be a pretty temporary situation. All right, uh, spring of 1906 now. Uh, Siobhan, tell us about the tactical situation. Um, as stated, uh, the Italian in Smyrna was very temporary. The Turk is going to take that right back. Um, still working with the Austrian, though, supporting them into Greece. So I guess we have an AT that doesn't like the Italian. Um, England does take French help, tries to get into the Western Med, um, won't happen this season, but next season it will with the shifting of units in Iberia. Um, convoy the army onto the continent. Well done, England. And the EG continues on and is stronger than ever. And uh, Marcus, tell us about the strategic, uh, how this affects the strategic situation. Yeah, we still see this England-Germany sticking together. Um, France obviously trying to say, okay, I'll work with you, just leave me alive longer than someone on this board, maybe yeah. Italy, so I get a few more points. Um, England looks to be not buying that, and they're, they're <laughs> no. they'll also take the French centers, uh, although they could leave Paris open, we'll see. Um, elsewhere, we've got, I mean, the on the eastern side of the board, they're, they kind of need to be uniting right about now because they've got this big threat coming across their border and they're not. They're still going, I'll knock you out of Smyrna, I'll knock you out of Greece. Uh, you know, maybe we'll we'll try and eliminate you. I wonder if they're just going to leave Italy on those three centers, given they're not making a move over there. But I really think they should have cut a deal rather than continuing to attack. Yeah, especially in Carnage, the question of you know where uh, where the gains, um, you know, the risks meet the or the rewards meet the risks. I have to say, uh, at, but you know the calculations in Carnage can be a little bit harder to make. Um, you know, it has the advantage; of, it has a, the virtue of conceptual simplicity. But um, you know, figuring out exactly where you might land in the in the pecking order is is pretty complicated when you've got a bunch of players bunched together here. Um, and uh, those those players in the East are we have Austria at six, we've got Turkey at five. And Italy at five. So yeah, they're you know they, it does seem like they are fighting over a, a small pie while uh, England and Germany are getting pretty big on a, a large cake, if I can stretch the analogy. All right, let's keep pushing ahead here. Fall of um, uh, fall of nineteen oh six. And Siobhan, you are on the uh, tactics. Um, fall of 06, England finally makes it into Western Med and Lyon and Marseille. Well done, uh, Randy. I, oh, no, he stays on Paris. Um, so Paris remains up for the grabs for England whenever he wants it. Um, the Italian moves east because he's annoyed at the AT, <laughs> picking him off instead of helping him hold the line against the inevitable EG coming around the corner. Um, Germany passes up the chance to take Moscow now for some positioning around Galicia. Um, so, oh, the, Germany and Turkey have struck a deal to knock Austria down a few pegs. Craig's got a little too big for his britches. Uh, yeah, Marcus, you like this? What's going on in the East here? 
Uh, I mean, <laughs> like, obviously Italy really unhappy about that, right? Um, justifiably so. They should have united last turn, and I think it's going to cost them all. At this point, it's like, how much do England and Germany want to push before they end this game? Turkey's going to lose Moscow. They saw that, and they went, okay, Germany, leave me Moscow, and I'll cause some chaos here, but actually, I mean, that might be in Turkey's interest, because if... Uh, if Germany and England push across the board, then Turkey's the natural person who benefits, but it could lead to a solo. And that would be a painful loss. Yeah, and it's, it's worth pointing out that Turkey uh, did not pull Bulgaria into the Aegean, which would have been the natural thing to do. Um, and uh, that means that even though they're picking up two centers, they'll only be able to put one unit down. Um, do you think that they meant to put Bulgaria to the Aegean? Because Khan moved to Bull. I think they. I think that was the intention. Uh, okay. I, I would assume Commits so. Order. Yeah. Yep. So uh, that that that's the sort of thing that actually could ripple through the rest of the game and uh, and really be a problem for Turkey, especially if they end up needing to just like just try to edge one of the the Western powers out. It seems like it's going to be hard though, uh, <laughs> just given the the position that each of them have. the The question's going to be, and I'll pose this to you guys, is if you are England or Germany. Um, when do you look to uh, to make a move on the other, or do you not? And uh, first, we can have a look at the builds. It sees England put down a fleet in Edinburgh, which is interesting. Uh, Turkey puts down an army, and uh, Germany did not have a build here? Or did they pass one up? Let's see. Uh, they did not take any dots. Got it. Their, their big move was last time. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this interesting, uh, actually, a little... Uh, uh, fun times around Norway. Both Sweden and St. Petersburg went to Norway, and Baltic went uh, could have covered Sweden. So, so Norway would have been guaranteed here, and it would still be guaranteed this turn, but it would not uh, after this if they decide not to uh, not to stop. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're England, or England. Uh, so we'll we'll split them up. Uh, you be England, Siobhan, and you be Germany, uh, uh, Marcus and uh, Siobhan. If you're England, um, are what are you looking to do? I ooh, I don't know if I see stabbing as being super worthwhile at this moment. Um, it's going to be a year or two before I really see it. And then I would want to really feel like I'm going for a solo. Right now, I'm only on nine. There's still work to do in the med. Um, as much chaos as there is, I'd want a stronger position elsewhere. Um, it's hard because... I think I ride the alliance to the end and just hope to edge out by a dot or two and get the board top. So it feels like status quo means you you top the board alone. Yeah. Okay. And Marcus, what about you as Germany? As Germany, I don't see a great potential to uh, take the board top by stabbing England here. England just has too good of a position to like fight back. Um, I do also think there is potential for England to stab um and and take a bunch of senses off of germany so as germany i'm making the pitch that you know we've stuck together all game we've been this great alliance it's carnage you know <laughs> it's only it, you're not going to get a bigger score by stabbing me unless you take the solo and you're not going solo so we should you should just show that you're a great alliance partner and, and stick with me here and then as england uh, as germany you try and push forward and get some more builds and hopefully get a step off of that. But because it's such, I don't think there's much potential for England and Germany to keep rolling because neither of them can really make the excuse that it's not for anything other than a solo. Are you? Do you agree with Siobhan that status quo advantages England? Uh, it's a difficult one. I think it actually... Well, I mean, it depends who makes progress. I think Germany could make really significant progress very fast in the East. And if they put the builds down in the right places, like if they take Moscow and Sevastopol in a year and get two fleet builds, they could potentially, uh, well, they could really strengthen their northern position. But... Sevastopol seems a stretch here with, with Turkey so strong, but uh, Moscow, obviously, it's now or never. Um... Yeah, but Turkey is, is working with Germany, right? So maybe you can convince right. them something suboptimal. <laughs> uh, oh, I see, I see, I see. But England's not going to get anything more. They get, they get Tunis, right? And then... And Paris. Well, they, and Paris behind the lines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I completely missed that. Um, so, yeah, actually, I think England is, is pretty much guaranteed the board top here. Um, so then that's an argument for Germany looking to make a move. 
actually. No, because if they do make a move, England will just get that board top anyway and maybe has a reason to knock Germany down a few. Oh, wow. Wow. So maybe yeah. Germany doesn't have a path to the board top here. That's a little surprising. You agree with I, that, Siobhan? I do agree with it. I mean, I, I wouldn't do it, but I could see why England might stab. Um, and then I definitely wouldn't do it, and you could not convince me that Germany should stab. Okay. All right. I, I, I feel like there's an argument here for Germany to stab. Uh, I, there's an argument for both of them, but I, there's always an argument. But, I, you know, if, if, if one of them can get the upper hand on the other, then they're guaranteed the board top. Um, yeah, I but think. how do you stab Germany here? Well, you take Norway um, and uh, you the, the key, I think, would be if you're Germany is to ensure that Turkey and Austria um, or that Austria is occupied in the south in some way. So whether it's fighting Turkey or fighting Italy um, and then uh, and then it's just, move, you know, you, you take Norway here, you you move to Denmark from Baltic and uh, hope that you can. Uh, and then you have to shift, uh, shift armies back. But I think you also have to take Moscow. I mean, that's the kind of, that's the trick is that you need builds really quickly and you need Turkey to be okay with that. But taking Moscow, even if it's only temporary, it gets you another fleet in the water and uh, maybe slows Turkey down a little bit. That, that would be the argument. I, I kind of agree with, uh, I agree with Siobhan that the status quo advantages uh, England um, just because of Paris and Tunis. Um, but if England, you know, if England gets, gets Holland, it's kind of over. England guarantees a board top. So, all right, enough of that. Let's keep going ahead here. Spring of 1907. Um, that means, Siobhan, you're on tactics here? I've already forgotten. I believe so. And right. uh, wow, okay. Germany's pulling back. Uh, takes Moscow. Um, England is chugging along in the EG as he always was, but loses Norway for the effort. Doesn't have a unit in Belgium because they self-bounced. Oh, so, okay. Um, and the Germans just going to help the Turk down in the south. So we'll see where that goes. And then a whole lot of nothing around Tunis for now. Boy, that self-bounce is costly, isn't it? That's, yeah, that was where my eyes went immediately. And as we see Livonia convoy back to Kiel, love those long convoys over the Baltic. Yeah. Um, All right. I uh, mean, yeah, go ahead. Marcus, uh, how does the strategic situation look to you now? Yeah, I mean, well, this was what you were hoping for, right? The German making that move against the English player. Um, and I think through the rest of the game, we have seen that England is the loyal alliance player in this. And Germany has been willing to make a few moves that are suboptimal to the alliance in order to benefit themselves. And like this is where you see that play out. They say, OK, I, I really need to take the stab if I'm going to have a shot at the poor top. I think if England plays this well, it's still very unlikely that Germany takes the board top and they could suffer from this because if the East gets their act together, Germany is going to be the one who suffers on that front. Um, but can't fault him for trying to go for the for the win and yeah. we'll see whether England can hold it. Um, convoy, the convoy here is interesting. I think he had a, a couple choices uh, with how to shift armies back. The one that had that seemed more likely to me was uh, Munich to Ruhr and Bohemia back to Munich. I, mm -hmm. I would have thought uh, that a working out some diplomatic arrangement with Austria so that you and Austria didn't have to fight uh, would be wise. But in this case, you have you now have like you know the good fences make good neighbors uh, uh, arrangement with Austria. Uh, the question is whether these armies will be needed against England or not, and. Um, uh, but he did need another army back uh, to cover Holland. So now he can cover Holland and Denmark from the uh, from the army in north or the fleet in north. But all right, let's uh, let's keep going. This at least gets interesting, right? This is uh, I mean, the, the battle between England and France was the only thing that could keep this board, uh, you know, could hold our attention on this board. And, and it's happening. So let's go forward with it and look at fall 1907. And Siobhan, what uh, what happens? Oh, okay. The first thing that jumps out at me is the German is getting two builds no matter what here, picking up Moscow, picking up Norway. England spends time supporting an attack into Norway that he knows is not going to work, when what he should have done is pull North Sea to Holland so it bounces Kiel back so that Kiel is not available for that extra yes, build. Yes, yes. Um, that's what I was looking at before you even put the moves up. So small thing, it took me years to learn that kind of move, but if you know you're not going to get Norway anyway, don't waste the time. Um, 
England is making up for losing that unit by taking Paris while also putting France into Tunis to keep France <laughs> alive. I think actually very smart. That fleet is very useful for him, especially since he has to pull a bunch back up into the north to fight Germany. But but how much was Randy Lawrence hurt hoping for a build here? I just, you know, <sighs> in, in his, in his heart know, of hearts, deep in his heart of hearts, you know how much was he hoping? <laughs> he's being the good pirate for the English player right now. But, oh, he wanted to put Army Paris down. Uh, yeah. um meanwhile in the east it's not as interesting um though the austrian pulls up into tyrolia which is interesting and italy loses a dot to the turks with the austrian help yeah so marcus talk to us about the strategic situation it seems like some of your concerns about um germany's move here uh, might be coming to to fruition yeah, it's an important thing to note that it looked really good for the German last turn because Italy just supported the Austrian into Bulgaria, which was, I think, was something we glossed over a little bit. Um, but immediately, because if that had continued, if that state of affairs had, had persisted and the Austrian had pushed against the Turkey, it's really good for the German. But no, Austria immediately turns around, kicks the Italian back out again <laughs> and gives the dot to the Turk. Um, in the hope that the Turk will work with them against the German, which worked out well. Uh, and in doing this, I mean, I think they're forcing the German to call the draw. They're like for forcing everyone to call the draw, right? Because the only person who will benefit from this is England. The downside, I think England's tactics have been really off this phase. Uh, as Siobhan said, that move to Norway accomplished nothing, especially the move to Piedmont is really bad, doesn't do anything at all. Um, it should have gone up to Burgundy if you're taking Paris, there's no reason not to do that. Uh, if you're And the alternative is just ask Randy to put you in Tunis instead and move Burgundy to Rare, would mm -hmm. have been so much better. Yeah, and um, the other risk of the Marseille de Piedmont here is that it, it uh, risks uh, irritating Austria, actually. Yep. And uh, Austria, you need if you're England, Austria is the number one uh, player that you need on this board right now. Uh, but you know, England can make the argument that it's headed for Tuscany, maybe it's going to take Rome, clean up the Italian centers. But Austria may think those are uh, centers that should, should go to uh, should go to him. All right, let's uh, have a look at uh, where the units go down. We get a fleet and an army with Germany, who really kind of you know, the hands are a little bit tied here with all the, the firepower coming back, just, just needs. Needs needs both fleets and armies, right? Can only build one of each, but at least can build one of each. Uh, elsewhere, we have an Austrian army in Budapest, which uh, is actually pretty interesting uh, in terms of tactical flexibility. That that could uh, could go a couple different ways. Um, and we have uh, so Turkey didn't get a build, and Austria Italy pulls the fleet in Albania. Uh, what Italy does from here is definitely an interesting question, right? Like, who are they most mad at? <laughs> what can they do to help uh Javon? um i mean that's a great question who they're most mad at um i it, it's a hard choice i think i i think it would have to be the austrian but then again tommy might just decide that you know whatever i'll do whatever the austrian asks me if he keeps me on my last two dots yeah, it's tough to be in that screw all y'all position, but also like I got nothing else to do. <laughs> I've got two units in not great places, but screw yeah. all y'all anyway. <laughs> all right, let's keep on going here. Spring 1908, uh, Marcus, uh, you are on the tactics. Yeah, I'm actually kind of surprised the draw wasn't called here because I think like Germany really needs the draw called right now if they're going to top this board because of that mm -hmm. Austria Turkey moving towards them. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, Austria moving everything up against the German, except the unit in Tyrolia, which is used to kick the English player back out of Piedmont, shows that that was a mistake again the last phase, because if that had stayed in Tyrolia, it would have benefited the English player a lot. Uh, Turkey getting given Bulgaria as well, it actually sets the Turk up for a really strong finish here. If they stab the Austrian for a punch. Um, and on the northern front, we've got England backing out into Burgundy with Belgium, which is just painful. <laughs> Why don't you support hold that unit with the English Channel and push Paris forward? 
I think what we're seeing here is that uh, England and Germany allied very early on. England did a great job on the diplomatic front to establish that alliance, but maybe they weren't as strong on the tactics and were getting their tactics from Germany. And now that that alliance is broken down, they're beginning to see that come back to bite them, the, the fact that they haven't got that backup anymore. All right, Siobhan, uh, so strategic situation is fluid, isn't it? I, it's There's so much in flux here, and I 100% agree with what Marcus just said about the EG. Um, you know, Andre's tactics all around this turn and last turn have been suboptimal. Um, nothing moves around the North Sea. The move from Belgium just... No. Um, you know, meanwhile, in the East, we've got, you know, the Austrian and the Turk moving up against the German. Um, I'd like to see that continue because it's really, really interesting. I'm, you know, Khan did move into Bull while Bull vacated, but I have to believe that that was agreed upon. It's a spring turn. Well, why, why would you agree on that if you're Austria? That that I don't get. Well, then why leave Bulgaria? I guess, I mean, you don't think Romania is moving at this point, do you? Um, I just don't know why. I don't know how that's a good deal for Austria if they're... Maybe he thought Greece was going to Serbia... Oh, Thought so it would just be a bounce. defensive, but now, but now Serbia is probably if if uh, if Turkey wants to, Serbia is lost as well. That's um, it's complicated. Is this a fascinating and complicated strategic calculus for Turkey here? Uh, because Turkey needs Austria to fight because Germany's topping the board, so Turkey needs Austria to fight Germany, uh, but also doesn't want Germany to fall too quickly because then England is just going to be secured the board top. So for Turkey to to get the board top, there's a real there's a, like a set of needles that need to be threaded, not just one. Yeah. So who? Uh, all right. So this is fall of 1908. Um, let's just keep going here. And uh, Marcus, talk to us about uh, tactics. OK, well, we see Turkey convoying that unit back out of Bulgaria again. It looks like this Austria-Turkey alliance is solidifying. And that's actually still just as good for Turkey. They can take those dots when they want to, especially considering Serbia moves away. Um, we see the Germans suffering, losing uh, Warsaw on that front. They do also get knocked out of Belgium. Of course, that was guaranteed. Uh, but again, England's moves to do that. I mean, I guess this was the only way they could do that and guarantee it this turn. So, mm -hmm. But having uh, North Sea vacant is painful again. Um, they're not going to be making any progress anytime soon. Uh, England does actually take France out of the game now. Um, maybe just looking for that extra center in case the game draws here and then they get the joint board top. I think it makes sense. Um, uh, wouldn't yeah. it be just a straight board top? Germany goes down one, England would go up one. Oh yeah, that's true. It is a straight board top. Uh, no, Germany went down... Uh... Ten yes, nine, yeah, 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 exactly right. Yes, yes. Straight, straight doesn't mean shared. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, all right, Siobhan, what do you, uh, yeah, what do you make of how how the the strategy strategic situation shifted? Um, I think that everything makes sense for whatever reason. Uh, the board has decided that Wes is the one who does not deserve the board top. Um, you know, Wes was a weasel and he stabbed England for one. And whether or not that's why Craig and Mehmet are deciding to do that instead of attack each other, I don't know. Um, I think England is doing the right things now, but the tactical errors in the last few turns are hurting him a little bit. Um, you know, Marcus pointed out the empty North Sea that's going to slow him down. But, you know, at this point, I think that England can hold on to the board top if they don't make any mistakes. I, yeah, I'm a little disappointed in Mehmet, although he um, we know he's told us that he's an alliance player and that like just forming those relationships is actually one of the things he really enjoys about the game. Uh, but this there was an opportunity here. There was a real opportunity. Oh, yeah. If he takes if he keeps Bulgaria, takes Serbia, um, then uh, he goes up two. he goes to eight at that point, mm -hmm. which is just uh, just two behind England. The trick is, right, how does he get um uh, how does he wants to make sure that England and Germany stay locked up enough while he consumes the Austrian centers and, and gets passed. So it's a trick, but the opportunity was there. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's there now. I think this was a I think this was a time indexed opportunity um, that uh, uh, that won't come again. England, England should get the upper hand on Germany eventually, even with uh, some suboptimal tactics here and there. But um, OK, let's uh, let's push ahead here. 
builds, find uh, another fleet for England, which you know, at this point it kind of doesn't matter with England, right? Like England, they don't need more armies to secure the board top. They just need a couple more dots and then it's over. Mm -hmm. um, we get a, a, an Austrian fleet. <laughs> Craig. Yes. I mean, apart from being fun, like it was, another army wasn't that necessary, right? Fleet. I mean, I don't hate it. <laughs> I think it's to make sure England can't take the solo, right? Um, just uh, in yeah. case. Uh, but I think I'd have preferred an army there because I, I kind of disagree that this was time limited on the Turkish pass. I think if oh, Austria yeah. dedicates enough to the defense, Turkey can just walk into Serbia and Bulgaria. Um, <laughs> and there's no reason for him not to before the game ends. I mean, he can convoy unopposed back into Bulgaria right now, make the same walk into Serbia. Um, could make a push for Galicia right now so that he has play on Budapest. I mean, there's, there's opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are absolutely right. There's a good, a good argument for, uh, for army Trieste. All right. Well, I, you know, but uh, playing the player in this case, uh, you probably uh, just don't need it. All right. Let's see if uh, what happens here. Spring 1909. Uh, Siobhan, I think you're up for tactics. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start in the West. Uh, most of it is, England supporting Munich to hold, which I agree with. You don't want Austria to break into the center of the board at this point um, as much as you want German dots maybe for yourself. I don't know. Maybe England won't take any more off Germany and they've said, you know what? No, we're not going to let Turkey and Austria advance any further against us, though they do in Moscow. And there was nothing to be done about that. So, yeah, this looks like uh, the game is uh, settling. Mm -hmm. um, Marcus, do you agree with that? Or do you think uh, where do you think there's another twist in store for us? I don't see where much more of a twist could happen. I guess England could just go for the solo. They do have Tunis uh, secured across the line, um, but it's going to be a hard push there, and they probably get denied Munich or Berlin or something on the at the end. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah, I I think the straws here. I think there's no reason why Turkey shouldn't try and improve their their score a little bit. Um, first but i guess they're going to get drunk with austria and maybe that's just what they want at this point so this is even worse for austria than letting uh letting turkey tie them actually they're actually losing they're losing points by giving a uh, a dot away to uh to their ally i think they do still tie right because they're going to go yeah. seventh here but uh, yeah they but lose that, five points from it yeah that lowers their score uh okay then let's uh that is in fact how the game ends right here so the player oh. saw the writing on the wall and um yeah it's hard not to be disappointed uh that Mehmet didn't go for it here it's probably still a low probability option but uh but taking the draw here also you know <laughs> this also lures the score like we were just talking about um but look he's not a score focused player and there's definitely a lot of players out there who uh who are like that so uh, all right, England tops this board. Andrei Gribikov, uh, despite taking some guff from us periodically throughout this game for what we were calling suboptimal tactics, comes out on top. Congratulations, Andre, with 10. Wes Ketchum in Germany gave it a shot and uh, and gave also a mea culpa and was able to secure second place with that, which under Carnage is still quite good. Um, mm -hmm. This is only three about 3.5% three of the points below first place and that sets him up with a board top in round two to uh to possibly take the tournament title so well done wes on that and also congratulations on going for it i have to say congratulations on going for it and also recovering the same position you had uh when it didn't work out so well done there craig mayor in austria a little bit of rabbit out of the hat here honestly um craig uh i think had some difficult moments during this game but ended up uh, having a nice comeback for third place and in mehmet in in, uh, in turkey takes fourth place and elsewhere, we all the we go all the way down to two. Tommy Anderson manages to hold on to fifth place, and sixth and seventh were shared by Randy and Advate. Although, uh, because order of elimination matters here, Randy actually takes sixth place alone, and Advate takes seventh place alone. All right, guys, is uh, is this the right result for this game? And uh, Marcus, let's start with you. Yes, but also no. <laughs> so. Turkey should absolutely have at least let this game go to the winter phase so that they get Moscow, they get the tied position with Austria, and mm -hmm. they, you know, get those 500 extra points. You you have the position to stab Austria if you want to. You need to at least go for it. But we've discussed that Turkey isn't that kind of player. I think it's almost in Austria and Turkey's interest to let England roll a bit. 
and to try and get England a few more centers, weirdly enough, because of the way that Carnage works. If you let England take centers off the player in second place, you have the chance to get into that second place. And you are only one center behind if Germany loses Moscow. So, yeah, there was good reason to do that, potentially. But I don't blame them for calling it here. It looks like it's quite close to the end. And I think Germany suffered the results of exactly what we said would happen if they stabbed England. <laughs> it just didn't hit them as hard as we thought it would because England didn't push quite as quickly as we thought they would. I will, I'll, I'll give a little uh, a little shout there. I think um, that Wes, uh, you know, who knows what was going on in, in negotiations, but uh, Wes's path included a requirement that he manage this situation with Austria um, uh, more successfully than he apparently did. So, you know, who knows whether he, he gave that a shot, whether he understood that or not. But uh, uh, yeah, obviously that uh, that part didn't work out. But again, kudos to Wes for, for hanging on. Siobhan, final thoughts on this game? I mean, I think it's more or less the right result for this moment. Um, I agree, at least go through the winter phase and get Moscow. But, you know, if you're the kind of alliance player where he said to Craig, no, you'll, you'll get to finish third ahead of me, maybe that's why that happened. I'm still disappointed we didn't see a Turkish stab. Um, but yeah. someday, someday oh. it will happen. He, uh, um, yeah, so, I mean, it's where Mehmet is as a player, and he was true to that. So, uh, all right, congratulations to everyone on this board, especially to uh, to Andrei Gerbikov for, for topping, and look forward to seeing how things work out for uh, for all of you guys in round two.